Reverend Charles? Charles, you're up. You're up. Okay. Good day. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for watching, tuning in today. I want to welcome you to Universal Truth Center for Better Living online forum. I'm the Reverend Charles M. Taylor, Senior Minister for the Universal Truth Center. You know, 2020, 2020 has been wonderful. I would like to say 2020 will go down in, in history as a year of monumental change. Uh, the Black Lives Matters movement, believe it or not, has grown into one of the largest social movements in modern history. And the genesis of this season comes uh, from a cry of pain and issues almost 30 generations deep. To be Black in America, what, what does it mean to be Black in America? To be Black in America is to inherit a complicated and rich history and also be faced with equally complicated and persistent challenges. History and reality are coming to a head this year. So in 2020, we faced not only a new disease, but an ancient one as well. Man's inhumanity to man. It permeates every aspect of our lives and shows up in the very expressions of injustice that we're seeing protested today. No, no one, no one has all the answers, but for the first time in a very long time, the majority of people are paying attention. And UTC, the Universal Truth Center, is a part of this community, and we want to be engaged in the conversation for change. So, because our members are both impacted and seek to posit positively change the disparities and in inequalities that affect us all, we're here to have a conversation. It's time for a conversation that leads to action. So I want to welcome you to 2020 Impact on Black America and Strategies to Advance. We have a wonderful panel to, with us today, and it's been hosted by Mr. Wayne Dawson. But before we move further, we want to open this discussion with prayer. So I'm going to invite everybody to just become present for a moment as we acknowledge the presence of God right here, right now. And give thanks to God for this moment, this moment in time where we are able to not only wake up to what's happening, but wake up and seek solutions. So God asks that you direct this conversation with your wisdom and love and allow us to be able to say yes to your will and your way as we all seek to live better lives not only for ourselves, but for our families, our loved ones, for this nation, for the entire world. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. We pray this in the name and through the power that is in the Christ of our being and we affirm that all is well. And so it is, amen. amen. And so this, this forum, was was really put together by the board of directors of Universal Truth Center. It was an idea born from uh, Mr. Wayne Dawson, one of our board members. So at this time, I want to introduce our board president to say a few words and to introduce our moderator for today, Mr. Wayne Dawson. So David, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Reverend Charles, and thank you all for joining us. Um, we, we hope that this forum will be useful to you all. Uh, one of the questions that we as a church community have, have asked uh, for a long time is what is our role uh, in, in the, the public sphere, in the, the, the space outside of the spiritual sphere? And during this COVID crisis and during this, um, this, out, this, this outburst of a cry for social justice, we at UTC have also been thinking about how can we engage 
our community that we serve in ways that would be edifying, not only spiritually, but in, uh, in, in other ways. And so part of that, that, that charge and part of that desire to be of a broader community service uh, uh, comes about in the form of, of this form. And again, we'd like to thank Wayne, uh, who is one of our board members, um, for coming up with this idea and for bringing together the people that you'll be hearing from. So without further ado, I'd just like to introduce Wayne and I'll hand it over to him. Wayne's a, a Jamaican, he's from Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, he has been a leader of professional teams for over 30 years now. And, um, and he has been a, a leader in many of the, the areas of hospitality and, and training. Uh, when he was in New York, he, he moved to New York uh, way back in his college days. He served as campus director for uh, Dunleavy Novak Center. Um, he's had over two decades of youth development expertise He's had pivotal roles with the Boys and Girls Club nationally. He's an alumna of uh, the, uh, the CUNY System uh, City University of New York. He has his MSW from Hunter College and his BA uh, with honors from City College. And he's returned as an adjunct uh, professor at CUNY. Uh, he's taught in psychology and social work. He's the co-founder of Harlem Men's Stand Up, serving hundreds of disenfranchised Black men through network and resource uh, linking. Since 2014, he has resided in South Florida, where he lives with his lovely wife, Dr. Audrey Dawson, who's also on this panel, and she is also a member of our board. He's a, speak, a frequent uh, speaker and moderator addressing concerns around Black youth development and Black male empowerment. He's the co-founder with his wife of VIP Transformation, and he employs his skills as a certified life coach and NLP practitioner. Again, as I mentioned, he is a board member of the Universal Truth Center for Better Living. And currently, Wayne is the training manager for a Fortune 500 company supporting and honing professional talents, creating and facilitating leadership development and learning curriculum. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to um, our board member, our brother and friend, um, Mr. Wayne Dawson. Wayne? Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday and welcome to this forum 2020 the state of Black America and the steps for advancement. Uh, January 1st, 2020, where were you? Uh, I'm sure many of you were making New Year resolutions. For many, we resolved that gym membership, eating right this year would be difficult, or different rather. We would take care of our health. For many, we resolved that this would be the year that we were going to fix our home or move to a nicer space to upgrade. This year would be different. For some of us, we resolved that we would become uh, better with managing our money, our finances. We would invest more in our retirement income, or we would save our tax refund. We would spend less and save and invest more. This year would be different. We promised ourselves that we would be more conscientious about our politics after this. After all, this is a pivotal election year. Uh, those of us who never bothered to vote before, we resolved that this was the year, this year, that this year would be different. And many of us resolved that we would have the talk with our young people, the dreaded talk about drugs and about being pulled over by the police, the talk about how to behave and act, you know, the talk about work, how to act on the streets in the neighborhoods that we live for fear of landing in jail or worse being beaten by the police this year we resolved would be different so here we are half year through this year and for sure this year has been different we are dealing with the balance of two not one but two major uh crises in the states and in across the entire planet covid 19 uh, an infectious illness that no one has ever experienced the likes of prior and we are dealing with the ugly head of racism in a way that for a long time has not been shown and it's been shown all over the world and uh, in fact at the level that we are actually having allies in terms of white folks uh, participate. So this year, in fact, is different. We want to address all of these concerns in the time that we have allotted to us today. And so uh, what we did was we invited a panel of experts 
who could speak to a lot of these issues that will and does make this year, 2020, very different. We have folks from the sectors of disciplines that we spoke to just now, and uh, we will have today, let me just run through quickly and tell you who we have uh, speaking with us today. Sorry about that, let me, uh... okay, here we go. Hyacinth Henderson, who has assisted thousands of professionals and entrepreneurs jump off the hamster wheel of lack and free themselves from economic bondage by making a lasting shift to abundance. She and her team of professionals at the Henderson Financial Group understand that the real key to financial freedom is achieved not by working hard for your money, but by making your money work hard for you. Your mindset must be checked in order to have your money set, says Hyacinth <laughs> Henderson. The Abundance Guide takes her clients on a journey of uncovering, releasing, and reprogramming limiting beliefs so that they can experience a complete shift in their money mindset and take control of their financial future once and for all. She also places a strong emphasis on the importance of radiant, radical student loan and credit card debt elimination. Ms. Henderson is a licensed stockbroker, a registered investment advisor, and a licensed life health and annuity broker with over 17 years of experience in the industry. It takes cream to create your ideal vision of the American dream, and Ms. Henderson takes you on a journey of enlightenment and education on her popular financial education radio show and podcast, The American Cream. <laughs> Real estate, entrepreneurship, assets, and mindset. Ms. Henderson is a daughter, a mother, a leader, spiritual hippie, she calls herself, an enthusiast, a lifelong learner, and a book hoarder, lover of food, sun, salt, and unknown and an extroverted introvert. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Ms. Henderson. And then after 25 years as an administrator, director of Upward Bound and assistant athletic director of student services, assistant provost, Dr. Anna Price retired from the University of Miami in 1997. Ordained that same year, Dr. Price began serving as executive pastor at the Universal Truth Center for Better Living. While in that position, she commuted to Brooklyn, New York, and served as 26th founding minister of the New York Center of Truth. Her passion is prison ministry. Out of that passion was born the Freedom Ministry in 1993. Additionally, Dr. Price served an 18-month tenure as a prison chaplain with the Florida Department of Corrections during the period, that period from 2010 to 2012, she held the role of project director of Project Homeward Bound, an initiative of positive images that provided transition services, including mentoring to inmates transitioning out of prison. Her experience as a volunteer in the prisons and as an employed chaplain led to write her first book called Time Well Spent. Hey, Dr. Price has been elected or was elected once as the mayor in the city of South Miami in 1999, defeating a two-time state legislator and making history as the first African-American mayor in that city. She currently serves as staff minister at the Universal Truth Center, provost academic dean of the Johnny Coleman Theological Seminary and academic coach in the athletic department of Florida International University. She is a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated and Welcome, Dr. Anna Price. Great to have you. Dr. Audrey Dawson is a licensed psychologist and co-founder of VIP Transformations, LLC. She has over 25 years of mental health experience. She has the double masters, one in psychology and one in business administration. She earned her PsyD at Carlos Albizu University in Miami, Florida. Her postdoctoral work landed her in the area of forensic psychology. She began her career in social services, working with at-risk children and families in the foster care system of New York during the era of the crack epidemic. 
She moved to Florida and began positive impact in the lives of the fragile and vulnerable geriatric population as they transformed to long-term care facilities. As a black female bilingual therapist, she attracts both English and Spanish speaking clientele, spanning a diverse socioeconomic strata. She's currently skilled, very skilled actually, in developing trust and rapport across cultural groups. Most of her career was built around serving black and brown adolescents adults and family. She has spent the past 17, seven years working with county funded and court mandated programs addressing sexual trauma, juvenile delinquency and sexual offenses. These aspects of her work and commitment were largely influenced by her dissertation, Parenting Skills for Fathers on Probation. Mm -hmm. She's married to a wonderful guy and she has, we share seven, a blended family of seven uh, young adults, children, uh, and three grandchildren. Welcome, Dr. Dawson. Dr. Michelle C. Powell is a board certified osteopathic family physician with over two decades of experience as a clinician, health educator, and consultant who has dedicated her life's work to promoting healthy lifestyles for communities and families. Dr. Powell is the founder and CEO of Powell Health Solutions, PHS, a multi-speciality medical center in South Florida that serves nearly 10,000 patients in a holistic, patient-centered, community-focused model. Established in 2404, PHS fulfills Dr. Powell's vision to deliver increased access to affordable health care and focus care on the prevention of disease. Dr. Powell's expertise in public health, entrepreneurship, and servant leadership make her a highly sought after speaker and activist. From those platforms, she teaches that thought is the core of all social issues and advocates that change in thoughts as key to enact lasting change. Dr. Powell's commitment to promoting wellness and self-employment extends to her community service. She's the founding physician of Women of Hope, Health Occupations Promoting Education, a non-for-profit that sponsors grassroots community health awareness and education international. Dr. Powell also administers and participates in annual medical missions to her native island, Jamaica. She's a longtime member of the Universal Truth Center for Better Living, where she has served as a youth empowerment director, board member, and two-time board of director president. Dr. Powell is strong in family, and she has right now two lovely sons, Khalil and Akil Cole, who are students at FIU and Georgetown, respectively. Dr. Powell is a healer and educator. Her expertise in leadership and compassion and faith have made a difference to the people and the field she is so long and selflessly served. Welcome, Dr. Powell. Thank you. The Honorable Norman O. Hammonds III is Chief Federal Administrative Law Judge who oversees Title II and Title XVI. I think I got those numericals right, T-16. Cases under the Social Security Act. Previously, Judge Hemmings served as special counsel to the United States Attorney with the United States Department of Justice. In this position, he oversaw a team of over 230 attorneys and an equal number of support staff based in offices in Key West, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, and Fort Pierce. He's a Merit Fellow graduate of Howard Law School, where he served as associate editor of the Law Journal and president of the Student Bar Association. He also has a theology degree from Shilal Theological Seminary in Stafford, Virginia, and is an ordained minister. He presently serves as the, on the pastor's council of Cooper's City Church of God. Additionally, the judge has previously served as on the Vice Provost Council for Florida International University, championing the raising and distribution of scholarships to students of FIU, first in their family to attend college. The judge has previously served as the 
on the board of the Easter Seals of Florida and remains active in advocating on behalf of the neurologically challenged. Just Hemmings is a recipient of the coveted Care Florida Award, the 2016 Community Service Award from the Pakistani Americans Association, the Special Agent in Charge Award from the FBI Miami Division, among various other distinguished awards. He is long time and happily married and is the father of two children, Imani, a first year law student, and Rachel, who is a senior at Florida International University. Welcome, Honorable Judge Cummins. Hemmings, pardon me. And then there is Perry Ecton, who serves as the president and CEO for Sustainable Housing Inc. Mr. Ecton established the company whose primary function is to act on behalf of the owners for real estate development. His clients include faith-based and non-for-profit organizations, public housing agencies, and municipalities located primarily in South Florida. In December 2018, Sustainable Housing Inc. obtained its certified residential contractors license in the state of Florida and added residential contracting to their services. He has 16 years tenure working in leadership for Habitat for Humanity, Broward, growing into the role of executive director from 2012 to 2016. In that capacity, he directed the daily operations of a 31-year-old affiliate of Habitat for Humanity International, whose mission it was to provide housing for families with income levels 40 to 80% of Broward County's median. During his career, which spanned over 40 years, he has held several executive director's position, including eight years at Creative Assistant Development, Inc., directing the daily operations of a community housing development organization, CADIS. CADIS' mission is to provide affordable housing opportunities to low and moderate income families in Kane and Western Cook Counties, Illinois. He's consulted with public housing agencies, not-for-profit and faith-based organizations and private developers. He holds a master's degree with distinction in community development from North Park University in Chicago and a bachelor's in economics from the University of San Francisco, California. He is the proud father of two accomplished adult children. His son, a U.S. Marine veteran, married with two adorable children, and his daughter, a management professional in the field of food services. Welcome, Mr. Ecton. So I thank you all. What a uh, lineup of folk. And what we will do is, once we get through having each of you have an opening statement, a position statement, we're gonna take some questions. And so we're inviting our listeners to go into the chat box or the Q&A and field your questions. Uh, and we will, if, if you have it directly for any of the panelists, please put their name in there. And then we will take an opportunity to go through those questions to have them answered. Um, in the end, uh, after the questioning, we're also going to ask each of the panelists to give a one or two action statements that we can use as a community to move forward. And, uh, and also at that point, we'll have you share your contact information. So with that, let me invite Dr. Powell to open up. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you so much for having me on this um, Zoom presentation and to address this issue, uh, this issue that you've asked for action. Um, and that goes in, in unison with what um, Powell Health Solution is about, as well as our community action Zoom that we have every Thursday at 7.30. Um, action is definitely where we need to be right now. As a medical professional and family physician for over 25 years and a public health, um, with a master's in public health, right now we are experiencing and living with the rest of the world um, COVID-19, which has impacted not only United States of America, but the entire world, and more than anything, has impacted minorities, especially Black Americans in the United States of America. There is no doubt. This is not the first time where an epidemic, pandemic, has impacted minorities and African Americans in the United States. Um, many people do not know, and John Hopkins published it this week, that back in 1918, the influenza virus for which we take for granted every year, and many of us do not get the vaccine, had um, over 20 million infections, okay? 20 million. 
from that, um, of course, African Americans were um, disproportionate. So this is not the first time we've had an epidemic where African Americans have disproportionately been affected. But one thing can be said, um, um, Wayne, and to our audience, why are we disproportionately affected? Are we any different? Yes, we are different. In the United States of America, which is um, where we are living, um, the health care is disproportionately misallocated and not allocated to minority communities and to African-American communities. We'll start with the source of health care, which is what? Our insurance. The minor uh, minorities in this country lack insurance disproportionately to the other members of this society. That is a fact, that is not hearsay, nor it is not just anecdotal talk. That is a fact. How does that impact um, how we show up in being affected disproportionately? With a lack of health care, which means you seek care later than the rest of the population, which means when we finally do get health care, we are usually sicker when we get there. As we address COVID-19, let me give you some numbers. In the state of Florida, in the state of Florida, looking at the zip codes of where the infection is highest, 33056, 926, 33179, 844, 33169, 941, 33162, 842, 33161, the 1,146. Those numbers are on the healthcare um, website in the state of Florida. Those are communities of color and they're the highest numbers in the state of Florida. Let's go back to question why. What are we looking at? The highest mortality and infections are running in individuals who have diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and chronic kidney disease. Who ranks highest among those diseases? Minorities, African Americans. So taking a pandemic such as COVID-19, which causes more fatalities in individuals with hypertension, diabetes, um, coronary artery disease, and kidney disease, it goes without saying that we will see a high mortality rate and the African Americans are looking over 20 to 25% fatality rate over the general population and only representing 13 to 14% of the population. Let me go say that again. We're representing 13, 14% of a population and coming out at 20, 25% of those who are dying from an infection. You should ask questions, why? Housing, which I know we'll address shortly. Crowded communities. Um, when you talk about having um, social distancing, if you're living in a household where there's no place for social distancing, that makes it difficult. When you talk, talk about who has the jobs it, that does not allow for you to take time off, that does not allow you to stay at home and work, who does not allow you what we call necessary workers, housing, um, people are in kitchens, people are working at the lower level jobs, they don't get childcare credits, okay? Which means they're working, that's minority, that's a huge minority population. So with no childcare credit, with no insurance, with crowded housing, um, uh, with inner cities that do not have the healthcare access that we see with multi-specialty clinics popping up in more suburban areas, with more um, affluent areas, you will find a higher disease state. This is not new. The pandemic is only shown with has existed in the United States for over many decades, hundreds of years. So here we are. I know Wayne, we said we'll talk about answers, but I'm bringing you fast forward to answers real quickly uh, with my few minutes. Um, we need to eliminate hypertension and diabetes in our household and coronary artery disease. How do we do that? We have to get back to basics on healthcare, eating right, taking care of our physical health, being active, really watching what we're eating. We cannot expect others to do that for us. We've always been a village and the village has to now become part of making the village healthy. So later on, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but please understand this pandemic COVID-19 is an expression of a social, economic, financial infrastructure built on racism. And that is why we are seeing healthcare disparities 
within African American population and other minority groups in the United States. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Uh, just real quickly, I know that I saw a quick one, David, that someone asked about uh, resolutions because they felt fearful with the information, but we must face what's what. We need to know the facts. We need to know what we're dealing with. So we will get to those resolves later on in terms of what you can do, but let us not dig our sand and put our heads in there. We need to know what's going on. So thank you, Dr. Powell. Dr. Dawson, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on the panel today. So as I work, run my practice, VIP Transformations, uh, one of the things as far as COVID-19, um, the relation of COVID-19 in the mental health industry, we're looking at stressors. And there's just stressors of being exposed, stressors of getting sick, and, and the, the reality of, of death. So as Dr. Powell said, we know, uh, in, initially I know there was some talk of us being immune to it, but we not only now know we're not immune, uh, but when we do get it, just like anybody else can, we are more likely gonna die from it. So based on these underlying uh, conditions that Dr. Powell spoke about. So as, and as we, we think about how we define families, for us, the family is not a nuclear family. It, we live in more extended family units. As a matter of fact, 85 million families in the 2014 census lived in extended family units. That means that it's not just the parents and the kids, it's grandma, it's grandpa, it's maybe an aunt or uncle, you know, it's our cousins or maybe even friends who are close to the family and we consider family. And not to mention, we often babysit each other's children uh, because we work as a community, right? Within our family units and within the community. So, um, you know, we have a, a, a lot of concerns when it comes to how we may in, infect our, our loved ones. And then the majority of people who work in service industries are overwhelmingly black and brown people. So this means higher levels of exposure that we may be bringing back home. And all of these concerns and all of these stressors, you see, an, I see an increase in anxiety disorders, which is definitely one of the things that we're all looking at, looking at in uh, the psychological field and the mental health field that we're seeing increases in uh, anxiety disorders and increases in trauma-based disorders as well as those are who are directly impacted by this pandemic are you know, dealing with the, the trauma of losing loved ones. Then there's the other side of COVID, you know, the stress of being home all day with our loved ones. So there's an increase in marital partner discord. There's an increase in family dysfunction as parents are trying to homeschool children you know, becoming teacher assistants at home. And we also see depressive symptoms in our children due to the isolation that they uh, have from, you know, not being able to play with their friends and, and having social engagement engagements. The higher risk, the higher uh, risk at the end of COVID is that there is an increase in domestic and intimate partner violence. I think there's like a 20% increase worldwide. Uh, there's an increase in the number of child abuse cases that are being seen in hospitals, while there's a 51% decrease in the reporting of child abuse because our children are not in professional settings where they may have uh, teachers or other professionals have coming in contact with them to identify these types of situations. And then the, the talk about racism on black and brown people. Uh, when I saw the George Floyd Floyd uh, murder clip, it was very heavy. And not only did we get exposed to that clip, it was multiple clips of, of, of exposing police brutality, uh, abuse of power, and just blatant racism. And the exposure of these traumatic incidents multiple times a day, day after day, it was just really heavy for most people in our community. And, and I saw it as I, you know, I had my own clients come in and we, I, I always checked in to see how they were dealing and how they were coping. You know, this is very similar to the impact uh, that our soldiers have when they go off to war and they come after they've dealt with those conditions, those war conditions, and they come back with post-traumatic stress disorder. It's very real for us too, because we are, it, we're seeing these traumatic images over and over again with a real understanding that it can be us, it can be our child, 
It can be our husband or any of our loved ones. And that exposure to those things are just as impactful, you know? And, and the, the, the part that really gets me is that there's a stigma behind healthcare. And even though they're really working hard, and I can say that in the last year or so, I have seen an increase and people of color coming out to get services. But the reality is that the narrative of black and brown people is that we find strength in overcoming adversity and, 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 and oppression. And we tend to do that through uh, our faith, our family, our community, and our church. And we have a collective, collectivistic view of you know, how we live. And so we speak to our family members to resolve conflicts, but sometimes they don't have the answers. you know. The narrative of mental health tends to be a more of a, a, a white person thing or an individualistic thing. It's very sterile sometimes as far as, you know, our perspective on it. And the concern is for us is that 2% of the American Psychological Association members are black psychologists. So even when we as professionals are concerned, you know, when we look at, you know, our colleagues, the concern is, are they going to be multiculturally proficient to handle our diverse population? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dawson. Appreciate that. Because this is multidimensional in terms of its impact, we talked about health in terms of physical and mental and psychological health. Let us look at some other areas. Housing. Mr. Ecton, please. Sure. My pleasure. Thank you, uh, QTC, for putting this forum together and having this conversation. Um, I am an essential worker. I have not been able to shut my company down since COVID started, which is scary. Most African Americans are frontline workers. We do not have the luxury of staying at home and collecting a check. And if we collect an unemployment check in Florida, what's it, 275 plus the 600, we're never able to pay our bills. We're never able to put food on the table for our children. So let's look at how we got here and what happens to us during this thing. I, I, I applaud the, the two medical professionals who spoke before me. That is not my expertise. My expertise is bricks and sticks. If you want to live in a house, if you want to maintain it, if you want to stay and support it, that's where my expertise comes in. You know, we, we, we went through what the government said we were going to do a first wave of PPP to help small businesses. I can tell you three African American companies I know, out of all the ones I know, that got assistance during the PPP crisis. Three out of about 30 of my friends. All of them were turned down. All of them had credibility, all of them had financing, all of them worked with accountants and bookkeepers, but the banks they went to told them no. Those monies went to Ford, Chrysler, everybody else. The second wave came out. I applied in April, April 6th for a PPP loan. It was not until I called the regional manager of PNC Bank, almost at the end of May, that we were approved for it. I had to call in a favor because I knew somebody. If I did not know that person, my company would be like most small businesses today, out of business. And my company employs 90 to 95% of people of color. We build in Broward, Miami, and West Palm Beach. We are about trying to help us stay employed, stay moving forward as we go through it. Housing values are going to change as they have been over the next year or so. And we need to keep our eye on that. As, as most of us lose our jobs and lose our companies, the banks want to hear, they don't want to hear that, hey, you can't pay my mortgage three months down the road. They want to know where their check is today. The courts have deferred foreclosures and evictions in this market. Come September, as we get closer to this election, those safeguards are going to be removed. There's going to be a wave of evictions and foreclosures coming, mainly in our community, because we are not prepared, nor do we have the resources to get there. So we need to think about how do we help each other stay afloat? How do we, how do we look at what we're doing today and reorganize our own personal finances to say, how do we put food on the table? How do we keep the lights on? How do we keep the rent paid? How do we keep our children safe to continue to go to school? I love the fact that young folks are out demonstrating today to make change. There, and we'll get to results, but I have to say to young folks today, I applaud you because I grew up as an African-American 
in the United States, 62 years, and I watched this repeat itself over and over. I'm, I'm admired today because the crowd is not 100% black. It's about 30% white or other. And I like that conversation because that helps us get some real understanding. And I'm employing white females and young white people to stand up with us to say enough is enough. You gotta stop beating up on us. You can't hang us. We don't wanna get lynched like we did in the 50s and 60s. This is a new America and we need to embrace it. But we as a black culture need to understand how do we take care of our own? How do we find self-sufficiency? I know there's a financial person on here, Ms. Henders, and I applaud you for being on this panel. Um, we have a little bit of a history that goes back and, and that's good because we need to understand how do we get there? Why is it only three people I know out of 30 African-American, both construction, retail, and, re and restaurants got PPP loans? Millions of small businesses that were not black got all these funds. I have friends who are white businesses are doing half the business we're doing who got loans in three to four weeks. They got the emergency. I got no friends of mine who are self-employed who got the emergency loans in two weeks. It took me two months to get one, even though it was supposed to be across the county. So we need to understand the rules. We need to work with folks in our community to say, how do we get to where we need to be together? I, I have some uh, answers for later or some suggestions, but my five minutes just ticked up and I want to, I want to, support the cause. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that input. And, um, you know, you segued into the business of finance and Ms. Henderson, whom I know as a wonderful uh, advisor and instructor and actual practitioner of managing money uh, comes from a perspective that I have never seen before when it comes to advising. And that is the mental approach. Ms. Henderson, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dawson. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for organizing um, today. We need this. We need this now more than ever. Um, I think the, the title of today's presentation is interesting, and we must connect the title of the presentation and understand that the, the crises of COVID in Black America is the same crises of the United States in Black America, right? So since the beginning of time here in America, the crises that started with slavery, so race is about wealth and power. It's the same thing that we're dealing with now as I listen to all the statistics and things like that. I don't want us to get far away from how we got here and why we're here, right? So the, the, the socioeconomic effects of Black people have plagued us for a, a long period of time. And with that, I think 2020 is such a beautiful time. 2020, if you're still here alive and kicking, if you're under the sound of my voice, congratulations you have another opportunity and it's a beautiful time to be alive because some of us have forgotten. Some people forgot that our ancestors went through the, the fighting and the slavery and the surviving and now it's our duty to thrive. And since some of us have forgotten, COVID, the pandemic, everything else is waking us up, not because racism has been dead, racism had moved to being a structural issue instead of being right out front, right? So when we put that into context and understand that this is not a new problem, this is an America problem, and when we know that it's America problem, then what do we need to do? So from the financial planning perspective, right, as a financial professional, and I'm going to start giving you guys some solutions straight off the bat, right? I know, Mr. Dawson, I hope you don't mind that, but, but I, I feel like, you know, as, as you can tell, this is something that I'm very passionate about, right? So one of the things that we can stop doing immediately is stop trying to seek the approval and, and, and trying to focus on how to live the white American dream. There's a reason why I named my podcast The American Cream, not Dream, because The American Dream was built on a fallacy. It wasn't built for Black people. And so CREAM stands for credit, real estate, entrepreneurship, assets, and mindset, because those are the five areas that we have got to focus on if we want to make a difference, if we don't want to have the next 400 years look like our previous 500 years, right? So what do I mean by that in the financial planning world? First of all, understand ain't nobody that you know or your mother knows or your cousin knows got rich off of a 401k. So when, I, when, when you come to me in my office and I say to you, listen, we got to have different conversations. You have to unlearn what they have programmed you to, to believe. You have to unlearn that behavior and open yourself up 
for other strategies. Don't tell me about what your HR department is telling you. Don't tell me about what the talking heads on TV are telling you because I want you to understand now. Don't forget how we got here. Don't forget what, is, what America was built on. So if, if you understand that and if you don't forget your history, then you can say, all right, well, you know what? That's true. Let me unlearn old behaviors and strategies that I've been told and sold and taught to believe that were going to be advantageous to me and let me tap into an expert. And when I mean tapping into an expert, I mean, let me see what she has demonstrated. Let me look at the law of demonstration. Let me look at the logic that comes with these new strategies. As Mr. Dawson said, I am big on mindset because before you can get your money set, you got to get your mindset. Mindset says, wait a minute, I have got to do something else for me and my family so that we can really achieve economic empowerment. Motivation is different from empowerment. Empowerment is saying, listen, I have the tools and I have the skills, and now I'm going to do something to get to the next level, right? So um, come together. We got to come together as a people. We have to come together as a people. I want to say this loud and clear. It, yes, it does me no justice to be thriving in, as a Black person in America if my whole team isn't thriving as a Black person in America. If you look at the Jewish people, if you look at the Asian people, if you look at the Hispanic people, who were, are not a part of the UMP, European race and culture, what do they have in common? They have in common that they stick together. They come together. That is something that is very, very important that we're going to have to wake up and have that conversation and say, listen, I know it may be a little bit difficult for me to, you know, to, to support your small business. Maybe your price is a little higher. Maybe I'm, it's not used to what I'm used to, but I got to support you because I understand when I'm supporting you, I'm not supporting some big company. I'm supporting a family. I'm supporting a family who's supporting their children. I'm supporting a family whose children are seeing them build generational wealth and do this thing for generations to come. So that's one of the things we got to do. Secondly, we got to get a skill. You got to get a skill. We are in a society right now where people are looking at social media and looking at all this, the, the uh, and, and if it's not social media, it's regular media, it's mass media, where we're flaunting uh, material things and, and forgetting that we got to have a skill. You got to bring something of value to the table. How are you going to get something if you aren't giving something? That's universal law one-on-one. -on -one. So when we talk about skills, when we talk about what we're sending our children to school for and to college for and to get an education, teach and preach and promote um, and, and support them in learning a skill. Because once you have that skill, you can get fired from a job, but you can't get fired from your skill. And if that skill is tied to your gift and your purpose, you're taking that with you wherever you go. That leads me right into education. Education is, education is huge. And now I'm not talking about the traditional college education, right? So I, don't, I know we don't have enough time to debate college and what it's about, but education is for the purpose of you learning something so that you can take it back to our communities and better our communities. Education is not for the purpose of you hanging up all these degrees on your wall, paying massive amounts of student debt, and then begging somebody to fit in white America. That's not what we're doing in 2020. So when we talk about education and we talk about how do we make a change, well, you got to know something. You have to tell our children, the video games, all that foolishness, you like video games, son, daughter, niece, nephew, let me put you in a coding class. You like video games so much? This is where we're going. Let me show you how you can be, have a skill and be a part of the solution instead of just being a consumer and having a consumer mindset. External validation. It's another huge, huge issue that we have got to get rid of. External validation is basically saying, uh, slave master, do you like this outfit that I have on? That's basically what it's saying. We're talking about 2020 in Black America. It's Black people on this line, right? So let's talk about it. Because that's what external validation says. Because if I'm black and I'm flashing my, my uh, designer and things like that to black people who don't have no money, how am I benefiting you? How am I helping you? So when we think about all of those things and we talk about what COVID has done for uh, black America in 2020, it woke us up. It woke us up. Some of us been woke, but for those of us who've been kind of asleep, went back, took a nap, now you woke. Now that you're woke, woke, and you understand how the numbers look, what are you going to do about it? Somebody said, what do I do um, with my, my IRA and investments and things like that? First of all, you got to understand, you got to stop asking those type of questions. There are no one size fits all investment um, answers. If anybody tells you without sitting down, they, I don't even know your age, your, your uh, income, your um, assets. I don't know any of that. But if someone gives you blanket advice like that, then that's a red flag. But here that goes back to external validation. We seek that so much. 
oh, I was on the call and she said, put all your money over here. How is she going to tell you to put your money somewhere and she doesn't even know you? Sit down, have the conversation and build the connection and figure out what it is that you are trying to do as a person and whatever you're trying to do as a person, as a person, you have a responsibility. If you got black skin, you have a responsibility to understand that your moves affect your entire race of people. It affects your entire, affect your entire community. I don't know if I went over my five minutes because I can keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'm saying it, it's uh, potent information. And so we just have to let it roll. You know, we're moving with the spirit, aren't we? Thank Let's you. Go. Yes. Uh, and I wanted to talk to Dr. Price and I thought it was very important because she has a special uh, take on a forgotten group that we are a part of. So Dr. Price, would you please? You're muted, Dr. Price. You're mute, you're muted. There you go. I'm gonna talk about prison population, but first I wanna thank you, Hyacinth, for going back to the slavery time. I don't know if you all are familiar with what happened during slavery, but I want to read something from a book, uh, The Willie Lynch Letter. If anybody's familiar with this, The Willie Lynch Letter. And this talks about, I'm gonna quote it, it said the first Africans in America arrived through Jamestown, Virginia in 1619 as indentured labor or servants. From 1619 to 1640, the laws throughout Europe and the Americas removed, good, good salient word, all human individuality from abducted Africans and named them property. From the time slaves came to the United States, we used, we used the skills that we have, what we brought from Africa, but the neuroplasticity of what our slave owners did changed everything in our brains. So we were considered property. I don't know if you all understand what that means. But the Willie Lynch letter goes on to say, the title is The Making of a Slave. The people who went to Africa did not bring slaves over here. They brought kings and queens and made them slaves. I don't know if you all understand this, but I believe that before we can even begin to talk about what it is we're going to do now, see, we're talking about effects. We're not talking about the cause. And I probably the only one raised in the South here on, on the panel who went through Jim Crow. I know what that means. I know what it means to make me think I was less than. Fortunately, I was born in Texas, so we knew better. But the point being, this is how we've been programmed. I grew up through Jim Crow. By the way, lynching didn't stop in, we've got a new lynching now by the way. A new lynching is called police brutality. Police were developed during slavery as slave catchers. I don't know if you all know that, but you need to go back in the history. We've got to unwrap all of that stuff we were wrapped in psychologically. We've got to do that first. It's wonderful to talk about what we're going to do with financially, but we've got to, and when you go back in the prisons, see, I, I was out front at one point, but I went in the prisons because I saw young people who were going off, and people used to ask me, well, you used to be out front and, and da, 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 in the movement and so forth. I said, I went where their fathers are, where their mothers are. They're in prison because they did not see a way because of the neuroplasticity that was done with us all those things didn't see a way to do what hyacinth is talking about we've got marvelous i mean youth people used to ask me young women used to ask me 
doc, you know, or Rev, whatever they call me, Miss Price, whatever, uh, I can't find a mate. And I would tell them, I know where they are. They're all in prison from 18 to 80. Do you understand? Or, or uh, and this is where I, I wrote my book. And this is a, a little older stuff, but it says, one in men between the ages of 20 and 34 is behind bars. But watch this. For black males in that age group, one in nine is in prison. One in nine is in prison. Not because they cannot do well and not because they don't have the talents, but because they don't see anything for themselves. One in nine is in prison. And we talk about the pandemic. See, I'm talking about George Floyd. Give you one example. As I was working in, in the prisons as a chaplain, I used to work at the University of Miami dealing with football players. I went in the prison and I saw this young man who was very athletically gifted. And I talked to him and he said he went to Carroll City High School and that he was recruited to go to the U to play football. He told me that in Carroll City on the football team, Santana Moss, I don't know if you all remember him, but he, he was a wide receiver at the U, went on to play for the Washington Redskins. This young man was the other wide receiver opposite Santana Moss when they played high school ball. He chose to go to prison. Santana went on to play professional football and is very wealthy at this point. Do you all understand what I'm saying? What has happened to us, we have to unwrap. We cannot just look at the effect, we have to look at the cause. Reverend Charles taught that lesson this morning. We have to look at the cause so we can get to the effect. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But, and what's going on in COVID in the prisons, you all have no idea what's going on in, in the prisons. They, they're overcrowded, Michelle does. They're overcrowded, they cannot social distance. Not only that, what you have is you have the corrections officers, you have the staff people there. It, it is just absolutely phenomenal. And of course, in Florida, we have the highest percentage second highest percentage, but I think it's the highest percentage, the, the highest number of people in prison than anywhere in this United States. Now, I gave you the, the, the data about men, but the fastest growing population in the prisons is black women. We're going there faster than we can. And it's usually because I had a young man tell me, Doc, I, it was the third time I had seen him, by the way, in prison. He said, yeah, I just wanted that quick, fast money. Many of our young people do not, and I had a young man in middle school tell me this, at uh, Carroll City Middle School. He said, the kids in this school the young men do not believe they're going to get past 18. What is that about? We got to do something. So I'm hoping in this form, and thank you, Wayne, this was a marvelous idea, and I'm hoping we can come out with something, but we've got to unwrap first. We got to see what's going on in us. That's one of my, my action points. But uh, thank you very much. If I went over five minutes, James, uh, uh, blame Charles. <laughs> Charles, we'll get it. Absolutely, Reverend Charles. And that's a great segue, Dr. Price. Thank you for the judge, Judge Hemming, please. It's your floor. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited. I, I don't know how I got on this panel with all these esteemed people, because I don't have the kind of background that they have. But this is what I'll say to you, that one of my favorite people, James Baldwin said, 
that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is first faced. So I think it is so important for all of us to be dealing with this. And so we thank you very much, Professor Dawson, for allowing us to do this. Uh, ju just a quick word uh, to you, uh, Doctor, with respect to that Willie Lynch letter. Those first Africans who were brought here in 1619 as indentured laborers, they came from the island of Jamaica. Just a little bit of, of historical fact there. But also, so, so, so think about this for a minute. My, one of my favorite philosophers, of course, is, um, is, is actually a, a comedian. Uh, he's a comedian who this year in January received the Mark Twain uh, Prize. And in his Mark Twain acceptance speech, uh, Dave Chappelle says this, sometimes you've got to be a lion so that you can become the lamb that you actually are. And, and so I think when I look in the streets and I see the Black Lives Matter movement, I, I, I'm not afraid by the movement and what the movement is saying and what they want to accomplish here in America. Because sometimes you've got to be a lion to become the person, the lamb that you actually are. And everyone that's been on the panel have touched on things that are so important. And it's so important, of course, to understand the history of where we're coming from so that we can understand what the solutions are going to be going forward. And I've heard some great solutions so far. I can't wait till the solution time and the questions and answers. But let's look a little bit at the history. Did, did you know that in terms of a, a legal um, background, that, that the law um, in the United States said that women could not be raped. That's during slavery. So that black women, not just any woman, but African women couldn't be raped. In, in fact, um, in terms of um, African women who were brought from the continent over here to the New World, not only here in America, but throughout the Americas, including uh, Brazil and Jamaica and Trinidad and Guyana and, um, and, and Puerto Rico and Cuba. Um, what we found was that most of the, that more um, African slaves were brought to the island of Jamaica than were brought to the first colonies of the United States. How is that possible? That double the amount of slaves were brought to this island of Jamaica than were brought to the United States. Yet today, the United States has more people of African descent than this tiny island in Jamaica, even when you count the entire diaspora. Well, the reason for that is that if you look solely at just the women, and that's why I brought up this law with respect uh, to women, African women not being able to be raped, most African women who were brought from the continent during slavery did not survive to see the age of um, having their first menstrual cycle. Can you believe that? That they were worked so hard, they were raped so hard, that they didn't survive to see that. And, and so we see so many of them, so many of these heroines and these male heroes who died um, before being able to even have children who, can, who could be alive today to do some of the great things when we heard our sister talking about the fact that we were brought here as kings and queens and then um, became slaves. Uh, not only that, but when we think of the prison system that our sister so carefully cultivated for us in her, in her presentation, did you know that one time in the United States, in the state of Alabama, 75% of the income for the state of Alabama came from former slaves? It, 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 they, what, they, what would happen after slavery? is that they would arrest um, young black men and old black men and, and women. And, and once they were arrested, many of these states had laws on the books that said that these people who were arrested for trespassing, for vagrancy, now think about that, trespassing and vagrancy. So these people were just in slavery. They were living without being paid on plantations. They were told that they could not learn to read or write because it was against the law. But now that they were freed, I tried to leave the plantation. They were arrested for trespassing on someone else's land. And then because they were arrested and convicted of trespassing, they now could be worked for free on these same plantations that they were just uh, freed from. But in addition to all of that, we also had this other law. It was called the Casual Killing Act. And the Casual Killing Act was one of these acts out of um, Virginia. And the Casual Killing Act was, was interesting because it was, it, it was passed by the Virginia State Legislature because so many African-American children were being beaten to death by their, their female slave masters. And so they passed this act to say that you couldn't get convicted of killing these little children because it was a, it was, you, were, you were killing them casually, beating them to change them so they could become the people that you would have them 
uh, to become. But the, the good news is, is just this. Although we went through all of those things, um, and although I think today that we're still suffering as a people from post-traumatic slave syndrome, almost like post-traumatic PS, PSTD, right? PTSD. Um, I, I, I think that there, yeah, post-traumatic slave syndrome, that's right. Dr. Degree, right? Uh, she, she's amazing in how she lays that out. But, but this is the interesting thing about that, that I believe that a change is about to take place, that this Black Lives Matter movement, but also the reawakening of allies who are both Caucasian, who are um, also um, from, who are Asians, who, who are Hispanic, who are from every race and background, economic, socioeconomic class, that you're gonna see a change in America. Because this generation, unlike the generations of the past, who accomplished a lot, they're not gonna settle for the things that we settled for, for the things that we thought were okay. They're gonna push us towards something that's greater and even better. And I'm excited for the question and answer portion of this, um, of, of today, and I'm sorry I went over my five minutes, forgive me. It's okay, let me say this. Um, I'm looking at the very robust chat, and uh, David, uh, you're gonna be looking at the chat in terms of feeling questions, but I think, David, do you think we're gonna need to ask our panelists and our audience for uh, the courtesy of running this a little bit longer than 2.30? Because we are right now at, almost 210 we have the questions to feel and then each person will do their closing uh would we need more time david add another 15 minutes perhaps i do you all have very robust openings and some of the chat that i'm also getting through other channels is people are very interested in discussion of solutions uh so we we really want you know this is what people signed up for so we want to give you guys a, a chance to get into your respective solutions. So I, I think some extra time would be in order. How about 15 minutes? Does Alfie, do you need to, um, to do any adjustments on your end? Okay, so uh, how about the panelists? Is everybody okay for 15 minutes? Of, yeah? We're good. Okay, great, thank you so much. We appreciate that. All right, David, you can go ahead with the questions, please. Okay. Um, one of them was, uh, I think, uh, already answered. Uh, Loretta McNair had asked, uh, where, is it the, uh, where is it best to roll over an IRA for growth with low risk during the volatile time frame? So uh, Ms. Henderson, I think you were very articulate about uh, uh, such a specific question and getting a general answer. But if you wanted to speak any more, and I want to give you an opportunity to. Yeah, so it just really depends. And thank you for the question as well. Um, it depends on your risk profile. It depends on your, your goals, your objectives, and where you're going. And so I would be doing all of us a disservice if I gave you blanketed advice, especially on this type of panel where we are really seeking to uh, make some real change. So call me or call a financial advisor, right? So that person does not have to be me, but it has to be someone who is going to sit down with you and look at where you are and to see where you're going. Because see, one thing that I do and I pride myself on doing is I'm not going to give you the answer that's going to make me the most money. And that's really what it, what happens when you ask a general question like that. Oh, put your money over here without me even looking at your situation. So I got to look at your situation so I can give you a personalized uh, response and a personalized solution to the problem that you're bringing to the table. So again, either that's me or another financial advisor, speak with someone who deems you worthy enough to have a conversation with you about your money. Okay, thank you thank so you much. Poignant. I'm sorry, David, but thank you. Uh, I, and, and I appreciate that poignant answer covers it all and allows us to, to move. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, this, this question is from Reverend Charles. Uh, what can someone do if they are facing a crisis because they can't pay their rent? Hmm. That's, that's from me. Right. I right, think to, it's to Perry. To Perry. Oh, it's to Perry, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to Perry, excuse me. This is Perry. Um, and, and that's if somebody can't pay their rent or mortgage, right. what can, yeah. In today's current market, banks and uh, financial institutions have not gone forward with the foreclosure process. My immediate, con my immediate thought is to have a conversation either with your landlord or your lender to work out a deferment 
or a workout situation that's amenable to both parties. Uh, the courts have stopped evictions and foreclosures for the short term. We don't know when that date is going to end. So the faster you can work something out, the better. Long term, there are rental assistance programs. Yeah, if somebody tells you to apply for Section 8, that's great, but the Section 8 waiting is like a three to five year waiting list to get on it. So immediately talk to your landlord, talk to your lender, and try and do a workout situation as a first start. David, okay. I see you're asking that folks feel their question in the Q&A section rather than the chat. Uh, the chat yes. is pretty uh, uh, robust with um, sidebars as well. So. Can you please redirect your questions if you uh, wanted to share that in the Q&A rather than the chat, which is general? Thank you, David. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, this is less of a question but than a comment, but I think it's something that uh, Dr. Powell could uh, speak to. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Jennifer, I believe. Um, I've worked as an RN nurse in Miami-Dade County where I was born, working in predominantly home care. I uh, recognize the unrest in the way that Black people have been learned to seek care and prepare for healthy eating. I think the medical profession has failed our people because we have not only been unsuccessful at putting Band-Aids on already set hypertension, diabetes, and or other co comorbid conditions. I know firsthand how changing behavior is extremely difficult. Patients just wish to tell us what they think we want to hear. Uh, blood levels show a difference. Uh, will there ever be a dialogue on how we can make a better impact now? Okay, um, a lot said in that. And let, let's address the education of the physician. Um, when we talk about minorities and African-Americans in this country, um, what we have to understand is there was no special education and training on how to um, treat an African-American um, patient. This was not a class. This was not cultural diversity understanding. So um, what you receive from any position that does not come from your cultural is strictly a, um, a generic format, a ge ge generic prescription, I should correctly say, that is meant to be passed out uniformly to everyone. You are not looked at as a African-American individual who has an experience that is socially and economically impacting your general health and wellness. That's not how you are looked at, nor is whether or not you can afford the recommendation that is given to you, okay? So when you give credit to a physician that they should understand your economic social background and make nutritional recommendation to you, that is not the training physicians have received in general. It's getting better. They're now teaching cultural diversity and understanding, but that is a new concept. That's why it is so important that you seek out and find physicians who understand you and your cultural diversity. But more importantly, I'm going to go back and give a straight solution because I don't want to run over. The solution is not about the physician you see. It's about you understanding the needs of your body, what your body needs to be optimized and wellness and then you seek out a professional to accentuate that okay so the answer to the question is physicians were not trained to deal with african americans um, as a whole nor to give out nutritional advice now i was and so as individuals that i work with so you have to seek out someone who has my kind of training okay. um mm has a question of uh, panelists, and if you don't mind, M.M., I'm going to uh, expand on it a little bit. It, it reads, we'd love to hear more about finances, but I'm, I'm going to reframe it. If it's not appropriate, you can just retype your question in Q&A. At a time like this, uh, among all the other things, we are experiencing a, a, a major economic downturn, a global economic downturn. As my grandmother used to say, uh, when white America sneezes, black America gets pneumonia. So this is an opportunity for us to shift and pivot uh, financially, uh, to bootstrap, so to speak. And, and Ms. Henderson, I think you touched uh, on that. But uh, this is going out to any of you that um, uh, have an answer for either entrepreneurship, banking, housing. What steps do you think we could take right now um, as, as members of the Black community 
um, to reposition uh, our community from a fundamental financial standpoint. Skill development. So for me, um, let's start with the mindset aspect of it, right? So um, yes, white America is crumbling. And it, as they're crumbling, I like to say that's not a that's not a uh, that's a white people problem, right? So mm -hmm. since that's a white people problem, and since that's a big corporation problem, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for the gifts that I've been sitting on? What does it mean for the business that I want to launch? We're in the age where people are making a million dollars. Black women are making a million dollars in thirty minutes on social media. Do you understand that? Black women are making a million dollars in thirty minutes. Black men are making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in a day on social media by using their gifts. So what are the actionable items? First of all, you got to get your mind right and understand that everything that's going on on the news and, and what was me and this company is going out of business and stuff like that. Ask yourself, how does that apply for you? How does that apply to you? Because a lot of people were shocked when they saw these big companies going out of business immediately. We had not been shut down for a month and all of a sudden they're filing bankruptcy. So first of all, that should give you, make you stick your chest out a little bit more and be like, oh, okay, <laughs> well, if they could do it, I could do it, right? So you look at it from that perspective and then you say, understand that your money is a tool. That's a game changer. When you understand that your money is a tool, you're going to stop using your tools foolishly. You're going to say, what am I trying to build for myself and for my future? If I have these tools and I'm trying to build something, I cannot be wasting them away. It's not the season for that. The season that we are in, when white America is crumbling, when the corporations are crumbling, because let me tell you something, as this pandemic is affecting us, you're going to call your favorite realtor and your realtor is going to say, oh no, the housing market is doing great. I want you to sit tight because defaults are on the way. And when defaults are on the way, how can you position yourself to take advantage of that? Defaults mean foreclosures, right? So what do you need to do? That means we need to be looking at our credit. We can no longer shy away. I don't want to look at my credit report. I'm scared to look at my bank account. Now's the time for you to look at your credit report. Now's the time for you to look at your bank account. Now's the time for you to get a budget. It is necessary for you to get a budget. We stay at home. You should not be buying no clothes, no shoes. I don't care how much of a discount they're telling you that these items are on sale. By the time you get outside, and see somebody again, all your old clothes going to be new anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to look new. So don't, don't fall for the okie doke, right? So you're like, okay, now I'm fine tuning my budget. I'm looking at what my necessities are. My toll budget has gone down. My gas budget has gone down. I have stopped eating out. Where am I now reallocating that money? Because what I don't want you to do is say, hmm, I have extra money in my account now. Now I'm going to Amazon my money away. Now I'm going to pick this up for 70% off. You picking something up for 70% off is not helping you in your fashion sense. It's helping the company who's about to file bankruptcy in the next two weeks. So budgeting and, and, and understanding the need for us to have a budget, understanding that we can live without certain things because we have a goal in mind. And that goal says, listen, all right, now the government, them people giving out all this money, what do they know that we don't know? They're not giving out all this money for a solution that's going to come for an economy that's going to rebound in 30 days. They're not doing that. So that's your red flag. When you realize that they're giving out all this money and they're doing things like this, how are you going to position yourself? Perry spoke on a lot of people not receiving the PPE. Vice versa, I know a lot of people who have received the PPE, right? And so what does that mean? That means we have to look at ourselves as a business, look at our corporations. How are we keeping our books and records? How are we doing that? A lot, of, a lot of times, my people, we want to start these businesses and we don't want to pay no taxes. We want to claim a loss and a loss and a loss. We want to write off everything. You got the side tree accountant telling you to write this and that off. Listen, if you want to acquire some things, if you're in the season of getting some, you're going to have to pay some taxes. You're going to have to have your books and your numbers where they need to be. So the first thing you got to do is to realize, wait a minute, I got to get my stuff together. Let me start with me. And everything that I'm telling you, I don't want you to make a mistake. I may be saying it in a way that is easy to relate, but it is going to take your consistent work and your dedication and your action. You're going to have to say no to a lot more things. You're going to have to sit here and say, okay, gosh, I didn't think I can do it. But you know what? I found 500 extra dollars in my budget. I'm redirecting this money so that I can focus on my dream. I'm reading this book today. I'm not binge watching my favorite show. It's not, it sounds, I'm making it sound easy. I don't want to tell you that it's hard, 
but it takes dedication and it takes consistency. And when you, when I, when I hear my people don't know who they are, I always bring up in my house and anybody in my office, I'm going to tell you about your ancestors and I'm going to tell you about our history and I'm going to tell you about slavery because they proved to us that we can do anything we put our mind to. Our ancestors, our people survived through that. Now it's our time to thrive. So yes, it may seem difficult. Yes, it may seem like something that, you know, is different for you, but it can be done. It can be done. So the takeaways are budget, mindset, unsubscribe from those stores, mailing lists, focus on your focus. Those companies are crumbling. We all have a business inside of us. We all have a gift inside of us, something that you could be sharing and monetizing. Now is the season for everyone under the sound of my voice to be doing that and share this information with your children. Share it with your children, encourage them, empower them. We got to re remind them of who they are, who we are, of our power that we have. Listen to those babies. This homeschooling thing, don't get me started on homeschooling. Listen, mm. don't get me started on the school to prison pipeline, right? So when, right. when we already, our black children already had a difficult time in school. And so That's now right. we want to inst further institution institutionalize them and put them six feet apart, put a mask on their face. You can't get up. You can't do this. You can't do all these things because of COVID. Think about the trauma that that's going to have. So if you can homeschool your babies, homeschool your babies. I think that's my time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, this next question is for Dr. Powell. Uh, Mary asks, what agencies are available in Miami Gardens to visit our elderly residents who live alone with no family and must stay in isolation 24-7? Oh, I am um, unfortunate. I mean, great question. And you're actually right. Unfortunately, this um, um, pandemic has caused um, the recommendation to go out and rightly so that uh, the seniors should remain at home because there are higher risks. But let me reiterate, the high risk group is not seniors. It's any African American who has coronary artery disease, uncontrolled hypertension and diabetes. That was an initial wave, initial information. So let's fast forward to now we're in July and what the truth is. The truth is that you're at higher risk, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, uncontrolled diabetes. So back to the question that's asked. If you have a senior, what um, agencies are out there? Home health agencies are available through your primary care physician if you are an advanced senior, that is someone who has retired and is age 65 years and older and need assistance. There, unfortunately, because we did not do Obamacare in the state of Florida, there's no additional dollars to have someone just go and visit or someone to perform what they call custodial care which is come in and cook and clean and help you with your little necessities in your house. That is not available because the dollars are not available um, in the state of Florida. There are services that you can hire, but you would have to pay for them. But if you're disabled, if you have an injury, contact your primary care physician and they can arrange if you meet criteria to get physical therapy, home health assistance. Now let's backtrack back to the village at hand. We know that seniors are isolated, but so are some other individuals. We need to just personally reach out to individuals. This is a mental health service, and I'm probably stepping on um, um, Dr. Dawson's toes here, but we as family need to reach out to one another daily. Call your mother, call your brother, call your sister, call your aunt, and talk to them and ask them how they are doing. That's social. We are social people, and just call in saying hello and how are you helps your health and well-being. The mind, the emotions, they're all one and connected. As your spirit goes down, so will your mental health go and then so will your body go down. So what we can do as a village is call and help individuals who are at home. But the reality is hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, what we can do solution-based, get it together, get real, stop eating like you do not have high blood pressure and diabetes, stop acting like you don't have these medical, number one, over 50% of African-Americans are overweight, okay? That scale is not lying and it is not broke. It is time for us to do what we need to do and get outside and hit the pavement. You don't need a gym membership. That's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Powell. Um, Carla Cody asked, uh, this question is for uh, Judge Hemmings. Um, what can we do to get the vote out, get more of the vote out now and now that we're doing vote by mail, what are effective ways 
that you've seen to make sure that all of our votes count? And what are your thoughts on the importance of the positions of state attorney, uh, public defenders, and school board? All right, excellent, thank you. Carla is an attorney, I believe, as well. In fact, I know she's an attorney, right. So there, there, there are a lot of things that we can do, um, Carla, to get out the vote. I can't endorse any particular attorney because I would, I would get fired and then I would need the assistance of my other panelists there to get my finances in order. All right, but, but this is what I will tell you, that you should encourage your neighbors, your friends, your family members to vote by mail. Tell them that they need to, to request their mail-in ballot now, today, right, before the, the time expires, so they can participate in all of those elections. Tell them and remind them that participation, not only in the upcoming national election in November, but in all the local elections, are just as important, in fact, sometimes more important than the national election, in terms of getting uh, the, the services that, that we need in, in this community. And then the other thing that we need to do is that we need to organize the organizations. You know, one of the persons who's contributed so greatly to the American um, society is uh, Kwame Tori, or you may know him as Tobi Carmichael, from Trinidad and Tobago. You see, these Caribbean people have always had this amazing impact as African Americans on, the, on, on this nation called the United States of America. And Tobi Carmichael, Kwame Tori said, we need to organize the organizations. So we need to get all of these GOTV organizations, the get out the, the, the vote organizations, um, running um, full speed ahead towards making sure that we do that. Also, we need to get uh, the churches involved, right? In, in, in that, you know, the, this whole soul to the polls, right? Churches shouldn't sit back and, and, and say, listen, we should have nothing to do with politics. No, we need to get involved as, as church leaders um, in, in doing that. And then lastly, all of us need to get involved in some more of the things that we're doing. And, and in the state of Florida, we have a unique opportunity here where we have people formerly convicted of felonies who are now able to vote. We need to make sure all of them are registered to vote in this upcoming election. And, and, and remember our history and remember, remember who we are and what we've contributed. Remember that the first um, female African-American to run for president of the United States, Shirley Chisholm, is of Guyanese ancestry. Remember the fact that Malcolm X is, is Grenadian ancestry. Remember the fact that uh, Stokely Carmichael, as I spoke about before, is Trinidadian ancestry. Remember that Louis Farrakhan is Jamaican ancestry. Remember that two of the women being considered for the presidential ticket on Joe Biden's ticket, and I'm not endorsing any candidate, are Susan Rice and Kamala Harris, both of whom are Jamaican ancestry. Listen, get involved, get excited. This is a moment of change, and you have the answer in your hand when you vote. Thank you. Uh, David, can you just quickly interject? Um, as we're watching the clock, we want to get through the questions as much as possible before the closing statements. But uh, reminding folks to not use the chat because it's so crowded and put your questions in the Q&A. That way we won't forget you. Very good. Um, this, this one is for uh, Reverend Dr. Anna Price um, from Horace Cox. Reverend Anna, how can we impact what's happening in the prison system? How do we, uh, what do we need to change uh, to present options for our people. I'm unmuting you. Reverend Ann, I'm going to need you to unmute. Yeah, there you go. Okay. There are a couple of things that we can do. One, we can deal with police reform. The people who are in prison were arrested and adjudicated um, and sent to prison. You know, so many judges, unfortunately, Judge Hemming, give our young people uh, 366 days, which means what? They cannot, they have to go to big prison, not state prison. There are policies that can be changed that uh, uh, affect us. So first, you deal with police reform. Who is it? that is arresting our young people. Now, I, wa I want to say this as well. Uh, you know, we, we embrace all of the uh, Caribbean brothers and sisters. Uh, they didn't have the same experience my ancestors had as it related to this. I maintain that Barack Obama was elected because he never had a slave mentality. So it's, you're not experiencing the the uh, um, uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome. So we have to be patient on some levels with that. 
when you go into the prisons, we can all volunteer. There are certain things that we can do to make sure if our churches have prison ministries and make sure you assist them, we can mentor. That's one of the uh, uh, crucial things that uh, people coming out of prison don't have. If they don't have something that they didn't have when they went in, if they don't have something new when they get out, they're going to recidivate. I mean, that's just simply stated. So we, we can make sure we look at uh, police reform, uh, make sure that we get, encourage people go, to go into the criminal justice system, uh, make sure that we understand that we, especially we've got a lot of corrections officers who are African-American. We have a lot, but they begin to act just like their white counterparts. See, and this is, this is something else. We've been programmed to believe that white was right. So whatever they do is how we're supposed to do it. So this is, this is super crucial. So if you are mentoring someone, encouraging people, get on these um, police uh, review boards. Make sure, I know in Miami-Dade County, they passed by very narrowly a police review board and they believe the mayor is going to veto it. But we've got to do these things. And of course, as Hyacinth, someone said, as we deal with the school to prison pipeline, we got to make sure our young people have skills. I did a, 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 a mentoring when we were teaching the GED in the prisons, and I saw a young man who was very articulate, but he couldn't do math. Because we, what we did was we took in a GED program. I mean, most of your churches go in and they want to save people, and that's okay. But we wanted to give, we wanted to empower. So we took a GED program in. I saw a young man who add it from right to left, or from left to right, whatever, which way it was, it was wrong. He, no, he added from left to right and couldn't figure out why his answers were wrong. A simple thing was to tell him not to put him down. You don't add that way, you go from right to left. He passed the GED, so he went out and he's still out. He went out with something that he didn't have. There are many, many things that we can do individually, but also as it relates to policy. Thank you so much, Dr. Price. Um, this is still on the subject of, of prisons, but this is for uh, uh, Judge Hemming. Um, what help is, this is from uh, Berna R. What help is available for the release of low level uh, crimes of the incarcerated? What can be done now since COVID is in the prisons? Yeah, so you can support organizations um, like the ACLU and organizations like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that are right now filing petitions with the courts on, on this particular discrete issue that people should get compassionate release from prisons all across the United States, not just here in Florida, because of the exposure to COVID, especially those who have um, the, the, uh, the comorbidity factors that the doctor in, indicated when she started off our program um, here today. Though, and in fact, uh, there's a new comorbidity, right, the, that they have announced from CDC. That just being overweight is a comorbidity factor. So it's not just diabetes, it's not just having a coronary artery disease, it's not just having some of the other things that we would normally think of in terms of comorbidities, but it's also just simply being, being obese. And if 50% of African Americans are obese, then you would imagine that that, that, that um, proportion uh, that we just described would also apply to our prison populations. So they would also seem to fall within the category of higher risk persons. So you should get involved with all of those um, organizations. There's one locally here in South Florida that's called Bold Justice, and they are intimately involved with getting compassionate release uh, for prisoners. So you might want to reach out to them um, as well. Exciting times, exciting times. Thank you, okay. David. Maybe uh, we should look at taking two to three more questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we are going to give folks an opportunity to reach out to all the panelists because we're going to ask them to give their context. So um, as we look for their final words, OK? Yeah. Thank you. I was actually about to tell you, Wayne, there's one more question. And I want, was going to suggest that we, we put a pin in it from there. So um, Christine Ellis asked, if you already vote by, by mail, 
Is it necessary to request a ballot at this time or will it be sent to your home automatically? Who's that for? Um, it was just a general question. Perhaps yeah. you can answer if, that judge if you know. If, if you haven't received your mail, your, um, your vote by mail by today, you should be requesting one. Right, because it means that you've um, dropped off of the list. So definitely, if you're in Broward County, contact contact the Broward County Supervisor of Elections, Miami Dade, the corresponding Supervisor of Elections, where uh, West Palm Beach. Do the same thing there. Contact them now today. Go online. Uh, call them tomorrow. Make sure that you get it sent out to you in time so you can um, have it returned. Okay, and it's returned by mail. You just go outside to your mailbox, stick it in there, put the little red flap up. Okay. Thank you, David. Hi, I I. I can I interject? There was please. one person that was missed. They asked, please repeat the meaning of cream. That's from. Oh, that was that, that was that was answered um, oh, okay. directly. Yeah, but okay. I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, cream, uh, Ms. Henderson said, is credit, real estate, entrepreneurship, assets, and mindset. But she she answered. Uh, that was Darvin Williams that asked that question, and okay. Ms. Henderson answered it to, to him. Thank yeah. you. David, what we're going to do now uh, to make sure that we're courteous of the time that was extended in, to us is to ask uh, the panelists to wrap up with, uh, you may have said it before, but if it needs reiteration and reinforcement, say it again, the action steps that we can do in our community and as individuals as we move forward to advance. And please state your contact information, yes. but do that slowly so that folks can get it. And uh, just to let you know, Althea, we are recording this live uh, uh, panel discussion. So Althea, um, where exactly will folks have access to this? Uh, I placed it in the chat at UTC Miami on Facebook or UTC Live on Facebook. Thank you. So let me uh, just segue into Dr. Powell, your final words, please. Minute and a half, the max, please. Sure. Uh, Dr. Michelle Powell, you can contact me at my office number 305-948-4701 or check out our website at um, phsflorida.com, phsflorida.com. Final words on um, the medical aspect of COVID-19 and what can we do. The first thing we can do is follow just the basic directions which have been given from the start of the inception of the COVID virus, which is one, continually wash your hand as often as possible. Second, use hand sanitizers at least um, every two hours when using hand sanitizers, wash your hands again with soap and water. Do wear a mask, like a seat belt, it is not optional. Wear a mask to protect yourself when you're around anyone um, and when you're outside of your house. And third thing to do, if you have any of these comorbid factors such as hypertension, diabetes, obesity, coronary artery disease, check them and correct them. And if you need to find a provider and you do not have a provider, um, contact me again at 305-948-4701. But I'm gonna segue into something which will probably take us to economic empowerment. It is time for African Americans to support one another at all aspects, at all levels financially. Find a black physician, find yourself a store owner, find someone to buy your clothes that, or make your clothes if you like your clothes made. Find people who are selling products from the African American community and keep those dollars within the community so that we can finally get some financial empowerment within our community. Start with yourself. Look around your house and find ways that you can segue dollars back into your community. Dr. Paul, thank, thank you so much. We're going to move on to um, Dr. Dawson. And, and we're going to ask that if you can wrap this up in a minute, folks, because we're that low on time. And please, let's stay with that and make sure that you repeat your contact number. Thank you. Okay, it's Dr. Audrey Dawson. You can reach me at my office at 954-445-4630. And that's 954-445-4630. And as far as mental health services, I really, I want people to know, you don't be afraid to request a black psychologist or someone who's proficient in multicultural issues. They don't have to have a PhD to be excellent. Master's level clinicians can be excellent. Most insurance panels have a filter so you can identify a black psychologist in your area. Uh, Psychology Today has filters for ethnicity and languages. 
Um, there's also Therapy for Black Girls website there on Instagram, and they also have a Facebook page. And there's also therapyforblackmen.org website that's available to find uh, therapists in your, in your area. As far as COVID-19, I, I, I wanna recommend, of course, follow recommendations to, uh, for prevention and lowering risk of exposure. Seek therapists that have experience in trauma-informed in, uh, care. A good therapist can help you put things into perspective. Try to make your home a, a safe environment to have conversations, to develop ways to be supportive to each other in your home. Make connections comfortable within the home. Make it possible to have difficult conversations about possible exposure in a caring and non-judgmental way. Learn to manage emotions. Managing your emotions does not mean not having any. It means being able to express yourself without feeling, um, without blaming others, shaming others, or judging people or controlling them. You know, you don't have to yell or hurt people to make them understand how you feel. And as far as racism, please take responsibility for learning more about your history. Black history did not start with slavery, just like we've heard today. African cultures in all different countries. You can learn about, do virtual tours so of the African American we, uh, Museum. Out of Sorry, okay. but we don't have to move to the next person. Thank you. All right, sorry about that. Um, Mr. Ecton, please. Sure. Thank you again for this form. Uh, Perry Ecton, 954-815-3404. Our company's website is sustainablehousinginc.com. On COVID, please follow CDC recommendations and take it serious. This is not the flu. This is the flu on steroids. Action plans, folks, vote. Vote and vote downstream, not just for a presidential candidate, but bring it home, city, county, state. Hire within our community. We resource our economic dollars back to hiring black owned businesses and then employ black folks when necessary. I know all of us can't do that from time to time because other talents are needed, but when we can, make sure we look at our folks first for those positions. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak here today. 954-815-3404. Thank you, Ms. Henderson. Thank you again. Um, I dropped my information in the chat, my contact information. We do a financial educational radio show. Well, now we moved it to Facebook Live every Saturday morning. My dad goes on at 8 a.m. I come on at about 9.15 a.m. That's on Facebook Live. Um, I have a podcast, the American Cream Podcast. You can listen to it on all podcasting platforms on YouTube, Hyacinth and Henderson. There are, I have loads and loads of free educational economic information to empower you to start from where you are to go ahead and change your life. Also, I, I dropped a link in the chat as well. There are two products there. Uh, Black Folks and Money is an audio book that everyone under the sound of my voice should be listening to. And then the New Underground Railroad is also an audio book. The New Underground Railroad is an audio book that talks about uh, finance, finances, the stock market, everything. It's an introduction broken down in an easy to understand way. Thank you all so much for the opportunity. Please reach out if you'd like to connect further. Thank you. Good idea. Can you all just please put your info, contact information in the chat for folks who are asking for that? We won't get back to that. But uh, let me run to the next person before we are out of time. Dr. Price, please. Oh, you're muted. Dr. Price, you're muted. All right, let me go to the judge and we'll come right back to you, Dr. Price. You can take yourself off mute. Uh, judge Hemming. All right, thank you so very much. It's Norman Hemming. You can reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, or Norman underscore H3 at yahoo.com. Norman underscore H3 at yahoo.com. Listen, I started off this, um, pr uh, this program by saying that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is first faced. Get active, get involved. Get involved with organizations that are bringing about change. And then there are three quick things. Uh, we have to recognize that we're all suffering uh, from post-traumatic um, slave syndrome. So get treated, right? Either in your church or through some of the medical professionals that you've seen here or, or, or elsewhere. Not only for us, but also for of Caucasian backgrounds. Then advocate on behalf of legal change. The 21st Century Policing Plan that was first put out by the Barack Obama organization, um, administration is something that would be perfect in terms of changing the way in which prisons operate, the way in which the policing organizations operate. And then last and finally, please try and advocate um, in favor of reparations because that's one of the ways that we can get the type of financial 
underpinning that can move us forward. Everyone else in the United States um, has benefited from that historically, except for us as an African-American people. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Honorable Emmons. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank Dr. you. Price, I just, you I have, just want to put a ditto to the reparations. A ditto to the reparations. We have to do that. Uh, secondly, this is no quick fix. None of it is a quick fix. Let's stop looking for a quick fix. We have to be intentional. We have to persevere, just like our ancestors did, and still we rise. Also want you to understand that racism is systemic. It is built, it built the fabric of this country. So there's nobody that can say, oh, I've never experienced racism. You're living it every day. So this is, and, and one thing we can do or not do is separate ourselves from each other. So that's what I want, but it's no quick fix. That's very important to understand. We have to stay on it and we still rise. Thank you. I'd love to, uh, before, Closing with a quote, just give acknowledgement and thanks to our panelists today, uh, Dr. Audrey Dawson, Perry Ecton, uh, Hyacinth Henderson, Dr. Anna Price, Dr. Michelle Powell, and Judge Norman Hemmen. I want to also thank the folks who made this possible in terms of the production end, uh, Reverend Charles Taylor, Senior Minister of UTC, uh, our business manager, Althea, uh, and we want to thank you, David Cole, uh, thanks to the board that's uh, in the background, but always helping in the foreground. And I want to close with this. A, and thanks to all of you who are joining on Instagram, Facebook Live, and uh, in this call-in. We appreciate the questions. We appreciate the attention and the time that you gave us. Uh, remember, MLK, Dr. Martin Luther King says this. History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. Ladies and gentlemen, this November, vote. Thank you all. We do appreciate you being a part of this forum. Have a great Sunday. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay.